The family office is an Anglo-fashioned concept coming from the 19th century. It generally addresses structures in charge of managing and or monitoring the wealth of one or several families with a holistic approach, from investment underlying to housing structures and family governance. When you combine a situation where in most of the countries in the world this activity is not regulated as such, with the fact that these structures are meant to deliver tailor-made services to their owners and clients, you end up with, a with an incredible diversity of company. It may be useful to try to categorize them. There is the single family office, which defines structures set up by, owned by, and dedicated to a specific family needs. There is then the multifamily office, which are working on the same pattern, except that they are servicing a fixed and limited number of families, usually two at five maximum. And then there is the commercial multifamily office, targeting a significant number of families, in most of the cases, tens when not hundreds of them. In this last category, we may find quite different types of companies, such as pure investment or management companies using a non-protected and unregulated family office label, private banking activity for the same reason, and companies offering a more holistic approach closer to the single family office duties, but with a different business model. We can then try to draw some comparisons between the very last category and the two first ones. The commercial multi-family office offering well services are likely benefiting from a sizable team with various backgrounds and relies on a fee-based business model with a mix of annual flat fees and or recurring fees calculated as a percentage of assets under management and monitoring and or one-off fees related to a specific mission. In that respect, the cost could be quite adjusted family by family based on needs, scope of services and effective time spent. Where, for the single family office or close end multi family office, teams are usually smaller. It could start with one person, even if some multi billion wealth family can set up structures with tens of employees and they are relying on a more fixed cost model, with, however, potential adjustment in managing the numbers of employees. For wealthy family, the question would then be when using a family office, what kind of family office is best suited and how much would this cost? We tend to say that the threshold to start benefiting from a family office service is from 30 to 50 million euros, which is usually the same limit drawn to identify the so-called ultra high net worth individual category. This is typically when families are considering elaborated wealth structures holding, like trust, holding companies, fund structures, in an international environment with cross-border interaction in order to ensure a proper diversification of risk in an adequate tax environment. The purpose is usually to improve the sustainability of the family wealth on the long, when not very long run, over several generations in most of the cases. The main role of the family office is to contribute to the design of the wealth planning and then put in place the appropriate systematic and professional oversight. Risk management is the key word. In these circumstances, benefiting from a multifamily office extended team is the main driver. The various background and expertise of the team allow cross-fertilization of ID partially experience in other circumstances. Besides, the multifamily office is also offering access to high-end IT platform for consolidated reporting and monitoring in a cost-efficient way through license sharing. In terms of cost, as already mentioned, they are only specific and mostly tailor-made situation. However, we experience that the average yearly running costs are usually contained at a lower level compared to the holding cost of hiring one full-time employee, renting an office and acquiring the needed IT tool. Furthermore, for this contained cost, you get access to 10% of a skilled tax specialist, 20% of an experienced portfolio manager, 15% of an estate planning expert, and 20% of an alternative 
investment manager, as the case may be. Typically, when the family wealth reaches or exceeds 33, uh, sorry, 300 million euros, it makes sense to consider to set up your own family office, a single family office. Actually, this level of wealth implies a recurring workload suitable for a full team, and the running costs charged by a multi-family office are in line, when not higher than, the cost of a dedicated team, from half a million or million euro per year and above. Then, the family is benefiting from a fully dedicated solution with a committed team for a similar, when not lower, cost. This is especially true when the family wealth is over a billion and more. One could then conclude that the choice, multi-family office versus single family office, is mainly a cost-driven choice based on the size of the family wealth. If the pure cost efficiency is often a global wealth function, there are other parameters to consider, such as the complexity of the situation, how many countries are involved, how many people in the family, how diversified is the wealth, the current and or targeted wealth allocation, uh, is the, the wealth coming from an operating family business, is it a legacy wealth, and the purpose of the wealth. Is there any philanthropic approach or is, is the wealth a source of income from different generations? All these elements will require more or less specific expertise, more or less diversity, diversity of experience, and will contribute to sustain the choice of a multifamily office over a single family office or the other way around, as much as the wealth size actually. Furthermore, in real life, the choice is not always multifamily office versus single family office. It could be the one and then the other, or even both options together. Let me share with you a few examples I experienced over the past few years. The first one is a first generation wealthy family. In the 80s, an entrepreneur started a new company. He grew over the, the following decades. After having accumulated some dividends, he considered to initiate a diversification of his wealth and to protect his family, notably in case of his sudden death. He initially worked with his usual advisors, such as private bankers, lawyers, tax advisors, and finally turned to a multifamily office. The main objective were to review and amend the wealth planning of the family, fine-tune the strategic asset allocation, and put in place the appropriate oversight. Thereafter, the multifamily office prepared the disposal of the family business and even contributed to the setup of its own family office, which was created immediately after the main business disposal and populated with two former senior executives of the sole business. In another case, a successful serial entrepreneur created his own large single family office after the disposal of his group. He progressively hired a comprehensive team of more than 20 people with a strong expertise in private equity, direct investment, financial, financial asset allocation. At some point, he realized that in his, asset alloc in his asset allocation, one could find some direct real estate investment, part as a legacy investment connected to his previous activity and part as a pure opportunistic approach. These asset class was very lightly monitored. After having assessed the situation with his team, he decided to appoint a multifamily office with a real estate expertise to manage and monitor its real estate assets. He considered that the expertise required to efficiently take care of this specific asset class was not part of his current team skills. And the cost of hiring a new team did not match the multifamily office offer. Lastly, we tend to see that the single family office is very frequently close to the main beneficial owner from a cultural and geographic standpoint. However, sound management requires risk diversification. In that circumstances, a very large single family office populated with few tens of people located in the Middle East appointed a Luxembourg-based multifamily office to monitor its tangible assets and structures located in continental Europe. As a conclusion, needs matter more than cost when it comes to selecting its family office. Thank you.
Hello everyone, uh, I'm Matteo Novelli, uh, Managing Director of uh, the Borletti Group, um, privately owned investment group and uh, uh, single family office. I'm happy to be here today with you uh, to speak about what is the cost of a single family office versus the cost of a multifamily office. Um, starting from the beginning, so the family office, uh, family offices exist since several centuries, but the modern concept of family office as we know it today became fashionable uh, during the last few decades in the US and during the last maybe 10-20 years in Europe and Asia. And many families in Europe, for example, decided to set up their own family office after the big financial crisis in 2008 and 2009 due to growing skepticism versus investment banks and private banks. So today, when I meet uh, wealthy families or successful entrepreneurs, they ask me, uh, they, most of them, they question about uh, the interest of setting up the family office, the single family office versus joining a multifamily office. And the first question they ask is the right question is what is the cost of setting up a single family office versus the cost of joining a, a multifamily office for example of the cost of working with private banks of course that's an important question but it's also a tricky question because the answer is not easy the answer is not easy why for two reasons the first one is that family office may be very different and if you pick 10 family offices, for example, and you try to compare them, you will realize that they are all very different in terms of structure, in terms of mission, and in terms of services they provide. And the second reason is that the cost of a family office may be also very different. You have some internal cost or external cost. You have some direct cost and you have some indirect cost. And it's very important when you try to understand what is the global cost to include all this cost in your calculation. So starting from these two simple points, uh, you have to start defining the mission of your family office. And here, the menu is very large. Uh, the the uh, family office may provide um, uh, administrative services for the family, it may provide uh, concierge services, but may also provide a wide variety of financial services, for example, like asset management, risk management, asset allocation, financial planning, etc. And also, um, there are uh, services like philanthropy or impact investing that are more and more required by wealthy families today. So depending on what you want to do, you need to uh, organize your family office accordingly. So the first step to understand what is going to be the cost is to understand what is going to be the mission of the family office. Concerning the cost, as I said before, uh, you may have some internal cost or external cost. What you have to keep in mind is that internal costs are mostly fixed cost or they are evolving by tranches. Imagine for example that you're hiring stuff uh, that's on your payroll and so it's a fixed cost that you will have. Uh, you, you, are, you are renting offices, you are uh, buying IT systems, all these costs are fixed. While you can also have some services that you can buy externally and these can be built on a variable basis. For example, uh, you have a wide variety of uh, um, consultants or uh, service providers like banks, lawyers um, and, and, and different service providers that can build uh, their services on a more variable basis. So when you uh, start a family office, uh, almost all the time you have a mix of costs that you internalize and costs that you buy externally. So for this reason, uh, it's quite difficult and misleading to try to give a, an absolute figure 
to define the cost of the family office. A euro figure or dollar figure, it's very tough to give. Also because the cost may vary with the size of the family office and the cost may vary uh, depending on the assets that are under management. So for this reason, a metric that it's my view uh, it's more appropriate, it's a percentage of the assets of the family or the assets under management uh, in the family office. This is something that uh, may be uh, more appropriate also to compare different family offices and family offices with similar mandates but with different sizes. And uh, also knowing that those costs, uh, some costs like for example the cost of asset management services or asset allocation services, uh, this may, be, uh, may vary according to the size of the mandates or the size of the assets that are managed. Um, it's also important to consider that uh, before deciding um, to start a, a new single family office, uh, you need to be sure to have the right size in terms of assets to be able to keep this percentage cost at a reasonable level. So what we uh, consider, I mean, in the industry as a minimum size um, to uh, start thinking about setting up a single family office in terms of assets, it uh, may stand around 150 to 200 million euro of euros. Um, starting from this cost, it may become uh, interesting and reasonable to set up a single family office and uh, you can start to compare your percentage cost with peers. If we have to give a, a, a percentage number, which of course uh, it's, it's, uh, is the, the key of the question, uh, I would say that the, the common range of um, uh, the common percentage that it's considered as a reasonable and efficient cost for a family office uh, stands between 0.8 and 1.5% of the assets under management. This cost, of course, uh, can vary significantly uh, depending on the mission of the family office, the number of services that the family office wants to provide, and of course the size of the family office. And uh, of course, uh, as the size in terms of assets of the family office is growing, this percentage number uh, tends to decrease to 1% or even below 1%. It's also important to keep in mind that uh, this number is an indication and this number usually includes uh, all the costs internal and external uh, of, of the family office, uh, but it doesn't include the, the indirect cost that you may find in um, hedge funds or private equity funds that the family office is buying or um, where the family office is investing. So this is often an additional cost that you need to add on your asset management cost. Um, it is clear that uh, it, what, what is important also when you, when you speak about this percentage cost is to monitor this, this percentage over time. So you start and you may have more external cost than internal cost but then, as you grow your family office, you, you have to keep running this analysis to understand at which point in time it may become more efficient to internalize some of the costs uh, rather than keep them external. For example, just a, a, a common example is the cost of uh, asset management or asset allocation or fund selection. Uh, these type of services are commonly provided by, by banks uh, and um, they are built on a variable, uh, variable percentage and this percentage may, may range from uh, 20 basis points for, for big mandates to up to maybe 1% uh, for smaller mandates or for some specific asset classes. So if you run a simple calculation you will understand that when assets under management 
are above a few hundreds of million, these costs may become very significant. For this reason, starting from four to five hundred of millions under management, it may become much more attractive to hire investment professional internally rather than buying the services externally or working with banks. So, if we have to, to come to a conclusion, I don't want to be too long, uh, I would say that, first of all, it's not an easy answer uh, to say what is the cost of a family office. Uh, it's difficult to give a, an absolute number. I would recommend using this percentage uh, of assets under management. Uh, a, a reasonable number is, in my view, uh, between 0.8 and 1.2 percent of the assets. And uh, I would say that um, a minimum size to start thinking about setting up a single family office, uh, it's around 150 to 200 million euros. Below this size, in my view, it may be more attractive and it could create more value to join a multifamily office, which is more organized, rather than trying to set up a single family office, uh, which could turn out to be a bit too costly and less efficient. So I hope I, uh, I, I, I gave um, uh, an answer to the question. Of course, the discussion could be much longer and much more detailed, but uh, it's a starting point to start assessing what is the cost and to start assessing if it's the right time and size to set up a single family office. So thank you for uh, having me here today and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Bye. Hi, I'm Paul Westall, co-founder of Agrius. I'd like to start by thanking Serge for inviting me to this event. Uh, it's a privilege to be speaking to such a distinguished group of guests today. So before I continue on my talk, I'd like to ask you to think about this question. What percentage of the total cost of running a family office is allocated to staff compensation and benefits? We can touch upon that, that later on. So for those of you that don't know Agrius, we are a specialist resourcing and recruitment company that focuses exclusively on family offices. Our clients range from well-established families in their third, fourth or even fifth generation to uh, entrepreneurs that are set up for the first time after a liquidity event. And we help our families uh, with resource planning, with recruitment, interim management, HR and remuneration reviews. So what am I here to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to talk about the cost of running a family office. I'm going to speak about staffing costs. And in particular, I'm going to focus on some of the interesting findings from our recently published Global Compensation Benchmark Report. And finally, I'd like to discuss some case studies from the clients we've had helped over the 10 years of being in business. So to start with, the cost of running a family office. So family offices are as unique as the families themselves. There is no standard family offices. They range from a 20 man team uh, with a large number of in-house services such as investment management, accounting, tax, legal, management of private assets, concierge service, and so on and so forth, to a two man team that has overseen external service providers. I'll just put a, a slide here that gives you uh, an org structure of a sophisticated, you know, full, uh, full family office uh, example here. So please take a look at that. And as I say, this is, you know, fully fledged single family office. So family offices typical have operating costs between 30 basis points and 120 basis points. A recent report by Camden Research uh, and UBS states that family office costs are on the rise globally and approaching around the 1% mark. Uh, and this is as families offices start to employ more staff. The entry point at which families can now set up a family office has reduced consistent, uh, considerably over the last 10 years we've been in business. Uh, although these structures are significantly more leaner, uh, act more as like a virtual family office. 
There may just be one C-level member of staff, such as a CEO, CFO or CEO, uh, with one or two uh, support staff within the team. And we've seen this growth in structure, particularly over the last year, and even more so during the, the pandemic and within the last four months, we've helped a number of uh, clients set these, these structures up. Uh, and the entry point here can be as, uh, around the 50 million sterling mark, but I think most commonly it is usually around the 100 million uh, sterling mark. Naturally, staffing costs can vary dependent on, on the size of the teams, which is, you know, it's an obvious statement. However, research shows that this can equate to anywhere from 30 to which is more likely 60% of the cost of running a family office, as, I, as the question I asked at the beginning. So I'd like to touch upon um, some of the findings from our global family office compensation benchmark. So we've been helping families globally with their resourcing recruitment now for 10 years. Um, and hiring and retaining key staff is one of the biggest challenges family offices face. And, and over the last 10 years, we found that the family office space is becoming very professionalised and is now seen as a genuine career path for high calibre job seekers. Uh, we, we set the, you know, to help our clients this in, in the early days to help them understand what to pay their staff. Um, and in particular, when there's a new setup, you know, it's, it's one of the cost factors they, they need to understand uh, and that they needed to uh, get some benchmarking and know they're not paying above or below what the industry, industry pays. And we also now help, it's helpful for clients that are existing and been, in a, you know, been running for a number of years. And they use it you know, for their benchmarking, maybe year-end reviews, when they're looking to take on you know, additional staff members, when individuals are moving on and they need to replace it. So it's now uh, becoming you know, a key uh, resource for our, our clients to, to benchmark and use. And, and I guess we're in a unique position because we've been had access to this primary data Know, placing candidate in family offices for the past 10 years. Um, but also we've been running, you know, secondary data through surveys and various interviews that we've, we've taken over the years. Um, and obviously at any point you're, you're, you're welcome to have access to this data. So just, just a few points. It's interesting to note that geography and culture does have an impact on the leadership of a family office, um, which again affects the cost. So for example, Europe and Asia have the highest number of non-family members as their CEOs, around 71 to 80%. Uh, whereas the Middle East have the highest number of family members within leadership positions. Um, I think at, you know, around about the, the 65%. And given the fact that USA, which is one of the most mature family office markets, it's surprising that 50% of their CEOs are still family members, uh, which we found quite interesting. Globally, there is a, a common trend with the size of, of, uh, of family office. As I say, they all vary, but if you look at the average, it's usually around five members of staff or left tend to be the average number. And mature markets such as the USA and UK have a, obviously a wider range of, of sizes of teams, and you can see it's not uncommon to see 20 people plus teams um, in existence. So, so over the last 10 years, we have seen that there is starting to be a bit of a trend with consistency in, in salaries. I mean, obviously, there is still a very broad range, and, and I'll touch on upon why. So the, the, the salaries can be very broad, basically due to factors such as size of the total assets managed, complexity of the wealth, the actual role that's involved, the culture, and more importantly, of the purpose of the family office. Uh, location does have a, an impact on, on compensation and, and obviously cost. So, you know, it's probably not surprising to note that sea level staff, you know, from our rest of the world report, which would include South, Central America and Africa, uh, have sea level staff that are, pay, are paid less than the mature markets. Um, and, and, and globally, there is a, a correlation between the AUM, the size of the AUM, and fixed salaries. We found there is, you know, if you are managing a family office that has more assets, you know, as a trend, you, there is a slightly higher uh, salary uh, in these and, and compensation in these family offices. It's not always the case. There are always anomalies. So, you know, it's not, you know, we're not surprising to see a 10 billion uh, asset family office paying less their CIO than 100 million you know, pound sterling family office, you know, it, it is not, it's, there are always going to be anomalies in this space. 
So um, one interesting fact is that the majority of global family offices pay their staff um, a discretionary bonus. And this can be, you know, we're looking holistically across roles here from 21 to 30 percent of their basic salary. Uh, again, that you know, when you look into the detail, the, the more investment related role, this could be higher, but this is just holistic here. Asia Pacific, uh, on average, pay the highest, um, and that can be between 31 and 50 percent of basic salary, uh, which is interesting. Though, so, so when talking about bonus, this leads me on nicely to um, another very important aspect, which is obviously one of the significant costs within a family office, is LTIP, the structure of formulaic bonuses and, and, and long-term incentive planning. Um, and this is very personal to the family office. There is no one-size-fits-all solution here. You know, family office bonuses um, are often uh, introduced once there's been a period of, of, of track record. And also, as we've seen a move towards more private investment, private equity, there has been a need to in introduce this because the, the, the talent that they're attracting to these roles are used to that form of structure. However, I think it's, uh, we always recommend and advise, and it's becoming common that you don't implement this formula structure until you've had at least one year uh, in, the, in the employment. So you can prove, uh, prove what you're worth. And then it may be easier to structure. We can help, we've helped many clients structure these, these types of initiatives that, you know, they, they all vary. So, you know, happy to help on, on that note. Um, but I think it's, it's very important to note that one of the biggest disagreements we've come across in family offices is when it becomes bonus payments uh, between the principal and, and, and the manager and the leadership staff. So these disputes can be, you know, very, uh, they can have a huge effect on, on the family office. And we do strongly recommend that having these early stages of, of the process, you know, sorted out. I think you know, most from our experience, family office is higher for the long term. You want that long term loyalty. And it's quite common that CEOs will be in the business for 20 years. So it's good to get this right. So, so, this, so this leads me on to my, um, you know, I would like to give you some real life examples from how, you know, on remuneration, on cost and how we've helped these, uh, our families. So that the first one, which is quite interesting, is a family from Central America contacted us. Their main business was in, in blueberry growing. They had been in operation for a number of years. The father started the business and then the son took over. Uh, and when the son took over, he, he, you know, the growth of the revenue, the growth of wealth was, was a huge increase over a five year period. He'd done a, a fantastic job. Um, but they also decided that actually they wanted now to, to diversify. They didn't want to have all their wealth held up within just their one operating business. So they wanted to have set up a family office. They had that, that amount of wealth now to do that and make other investments for, you know, for wealth preservations for the future generations to come. So it, it was the natural progression for the CEO, the son who, who'd done this for the, to the, for the family business to move over into a family office role. Um, the other siblings weren't involved. They had their own careers, but they were obviously the beneficiaries of the family office. And it, and it soon, soon transpired that they were unhappy that he was getting the same level as income as he was for growing the, the, the business. Um, but, you know, so he, we came on board, we reviewed, we interviewed the key principal, the, 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 the son, the, the siblings, the, all the key stakeholders in the business, as well as comparing that compensation externally against the market, against our benchmarks to see uh, where that, that stood. And it was quite obvious that they were significantly paid compared to the, you know, someone from outside of the, of, the, of the family. So, you know, we made those suggestions. It did not make sense to have someone getting paid that level if they were really looking for wealth preservation. So, you know, I think uh, there was obviously other factors to take into consideration. You know, being a family member, you have a, a vested interest to make, you know, bringing someone in externally, you need to make sure they're aligned um, you, know, you may be saving costs, but you need to make sure it's the right move. But as an overall uh, realization that they, they, it was unsustainable to pay someone at that level for this for this role. Another very interesting example, and this probably ticks on uh, takes on the point of when I say about the, the purpose of a family office really affects how you compensate and, and your cost on that. So this was a family that the main purpose was for preservation of wealth, but for philanthropic goals. So you wanted to give into charity initiatives way beyond his life. So when the, when the principal would pass, he wanted there to be this to carry on for future generations to be able to invest into a lot of charity initiatives that he supported. 
So it was quite obvious that the C, so the investment uh, person running this family office uh, shouldn't have been perfect, you know, focused on performance and formulas and, and growth. Uh, it was, it, that was not gonna, um, that was reducing the cost, sorry, increasing the cost and, and it wasn't gonna be sustainable. So they needed to maybe have someone on a higher fix, but not in a, in a, bonus, a bonus culture. So uh, there could be KPIs attached to performance, but this, you know, it was not sustainable to have a formula attached to that. So that, that really helped them reduce their costs and, and understand the type of person they actually needed for this position. Finally, I wanted to touch upon, which is quite um, you know, a, a new thing, is, is multifamily office. So, so, I mean, when we talk about multifamily offices, there are many commercial entities out there that act as, you know, essentially just investment, investment managers, and they just bring on lots of, uh, lots of clients, and, and it's, a, it's essentially just another wealth manager. I wouldn't know the cost in there. They work their own commercial, you know, structures, and the cost vary significantly. What I'm talking about is I've seen a trend of single family office collaborating with other families to create multi-family offices. Uh, and this often happens once there's been a performing a family has been in existence for a number of years, has performance, has a strategy on, on investment that's worked. And they, they invite other families to join them to take advantage of that success, but also to share cost. So, um, the, you know, this, as I say, there's lots of elements to just consider, and I'm sure it's, it's a conversation and, and another talk on its, on its own, but, you know, naturally here, there is a cost sharing. So it, you, you can say the overall running cost of the family office stays the same. Um, you know, some, maybe some small increases, but overall there is a sharing of costs. Um, but what we have found that this really only works for investment driven uh, family offices so it wouldn't you wouldn't be looking to share you know on tax advice you wouldn't be looking to share on accounting or management of private assets uh, that, that can be quite difficult so yes it works but you know I think the jury is out to 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 say how, how, how is the cost saving um, really really relevant for you and it depends where you are in your um, your stage so just in conclusion then ladies and gentlemen I'd like to summarize that you know the family office sector is growing you know, we, we've heard lots of stats, you know, there's going to be trillions of dollars of wealth transferring from generations, um, you know, over the next few years. You know, wealth is moving towards more individuals as, as companies and as, as the world changes. So, yes, there is going to be a growth in, in the family office space. Um, and with that growth, there needs to be growth for standardization and benchmarking, a benchmarking across all aspects of business practices. Uh, but, but I think when, you know, 60%, up to 60% of the total cost of running a family office is allocated to staff compensation and benefits, it's an aspect you, you really have to get right. Um, you know, please feel free to download a copy of our global compensation benchmark from our website on the slide above. And any questions, feel free to reach out, give me a call, um, be happy to help. Thank you very much.